All right. What is up, y'all? Welcome to my High Performance at High Noon call. Thank you for joining me. I am Josh Johnson, the Work-Life Integration Strategist. I am excited to be here, and I want to thank you for joining this call, especially on a Wednesday right before a holiday. My comments on the holiday will be withheld, but I appreciate you joining in anyway. All right, y'all. So, um, Welcome on in, welcome on in. Um, thank you. And I started this call because I do a lot of stuff. Y'all know that. And the one question I kept getting asked over and over is, how do you do it all? And I said, with a lot of grace and with work-life integration. And so this call kind of got started out of that space of wanting to share um, you know, a lot of the things that I've learned over the last several years with how to really strive and go for your goals, go for the things that you want and live the life that you want to live um, and not thinking about it like in this far off space, but how do we live that life now? Um, and so this call is every Wednesday at noon Mountain Standard Time, 2 p.m. Eastern and 11 a.m. on uh, the Pacific Coast. So today's call, y'all know I like to just jump right in because is this it's midday, right? All right. So today's call, we're going to talk about the subtle power of gratitude. And yes, it's super cliche because it is Thanksgiving weekend. Um, but I wanted to most specifically talk about the difference between thankfulness and gratitude, because of course, we are oftentimes encouraged during this time of the year to get thankful, right? And so you start hearing people talk about, you know, 30 days um, of gratitude and I mean, of thankfulness, right? And so they start talking about all the things that they're thankful for, all the people that they're thankful for, all the stuff that's happened in their life that they're thankful for. It's a time to be reflective, right? And, and I love that. I think it's awesome. However, I wanted to talk about this power of gratitude, one, because I want to be able to distinguish the two, and also because one of the things that I hated the most about this season is that people view it as a season. I mean, literally the next day after Thanksgiving is an, an entire day spent on materialism and going out and shopping and buying up everything that you can buy for the cheapest prices possible, um, you know, in this concept of gift giving maybe, right? Or of like just kind of getting the things you want at a really good deal. Um, and so like you see this kind of like immediate shift from the surroundings of family and the concept and the idea of thankfulness right into I want, I want, I want, I need, I need, I need. And those concepts are concepts of lack. So those two opposing forces are actually so contradictory. It's very interesting to me that we kind of lump them together this way. So um so I say that to say that I really want to be intentional about how to separate out what is the difference between thankfulness and gratitude, um, because they're often used interchangeably, right? And it's kind of like all apples are fruit, but not all fruits are apples kind of a thing. So um, that is the space in which we see that gratitude includes thankfulness, but thankfulness doesn't necessarily and oftentimes doesn't include gratitude. So, um, so I do want to distinguish them. I want to start off by that because I want to talk about some of the power of gratitude and why we hear people that are successful talk about a practice of gratitude. They don't talk about a practice of thankfulness, right? Um, and then also like, what are some of the actual tangible benefits? Because it seems like such a simple, easy, you know, thing to do just to be grateful, but what are actual benefits like scientifically backed benefits to this concept? And there are a lot, and I'm not getting into nearly enough of them. I'm just getting into the tip of the iceberg of what it looks like to create this as a practice. Um, and also I'll talk a little bit about my own experience and even just getting here, like the concept of how did I get to um, this space of practicing this daily? So that's what that's where I'm going to go with this. So um, so I want to talk about the, the difference between the two. Right. So first, thankfulness, being thankful is often linked to a person, a thing or an occurrence. It's basically a response to somebody does something for you. You say thank you thank you, right? Somebody does something, you know, to you, you get something like there's this exchange, right? And then you are thankful in that moment or during that time for the thing, for the person, for the feeling. It, but it is oftentimes in this place of response. 
where gratitude is oftentimes not in a place of response. It's actually really in, a, in an overarching awareness, like this totality of just being aware that goodness exists. And so there isn't necessarily specifics attached to it. Like you can find things that you are specifically grateful for, but the concept of gratitude really exists in the space of just kind of overall all awareness that there is goodness that exists. And why is it important that we acknowledge that goodness exists? So I'm going to come back to saying you don't hear people talk about the practice of thankfulness. You hear people talk about the practice of gratitude. So here is why. One, science backs the consistent practice of gratitude, like a significant amount of science. There's actually been over 50 research studies that have been done on the practice of gratitude and like what it does to us psychologically. So science backs the consistent practice of gratitude, linking it to happiness, health, relationships, and productivity. So this kind of total, this like total space of where you want to live in, how you feel, right? Um, how you feel mentally, emotionally, how you feel physically, how you relate to other people, and how well you're able to actually produce outcomes that lead you towards what you want, which is why I'm saying it's a success factor, right? Because when you get to that place of one, how you relate to people, and two, your ability to do the types of things that you want to do and get to the type of lifestyle that you want to live, that comes along with your ability to consistently be productive towards your end goal. And that is also linked to um, to gratitude. So a lot of this comes back to the place of like what you focus on grows. So if we know nothing, if we know nothing at all, we know that life keeps on lifing. It just doesn't stop. And so we have all been in that space where sometimes things are going amazing, but oftentimes we can always find a thing that isn't going well or the way we want it to, a relationship that isn't the way that we want it to be. Um, a place that we are not consistently practicing, maybe a habit that we want to practice. Maybe our revenue goals aren't hitting. Maybe our income goals aren't hitting. Maybe our savings goals aren't hitting. You know, maybe there's an issue going on with one of our children or all of our children. Maybe there's a problem going on with a parent. I mean, there's just a, a place, a thing, a space in which we can typically acknowledge something that isn't happening the right way for us. And it's even compounded when we have multiple things that aren't happening the right way for us, right? And so then we get into that space where we then tend to focus in on those things that aren't happening the way that we want them to, right? And it's easy to focus in on those things because they are causing us some level of a pain point. They are something, something's happening that is, that doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel how we want it to feel. And so what we focus on, whether good or bad grows in gratitude is that thing that helps us to realign that focus. So affirmations does this for us internally. You have a lot of people who just blow off affirmations and they don't acknowledge the negative self-talk that we have, especially when life is lifing and something is happening to us, with us, against us, however it is that you see it in that space, right? So something is happening and then we have a way that we speak to ourselves about that thing. I'm so stupid. I shouldn't have done that. I should have known better. I can't ever get it right. Things never happen good for me or things never are going the way that I want them to go, right? And so we have the space of negative self-talk and we can see that in all types of other places. I'm ugly, I'm fat, I'm stupid, I'm unsuccessful. Um, we have that when we hold on to these expectations. And so people will pass off the concept of an affirmation as though you're just saying something out your mouth instead of that you are reprogramming your brain to say something different to yourself internally. So the space of gratitude is that same thing happening externally, essentially. It is what you begin to focus on. It allows you to realign your focus to the goodness that's happening around you, even when something in that moment doesn't always feel like it's good. So that affirmation is that internal adjustment and gratitude is that external adjustment. So they really work hand in hand. And so this isn't the space of like false optimism or false um, positivity. It's a space of you realigning and being more in control of what you're thinking and what you're doing and how you're feeling, despite the fact that everything is not happening the way that you want to on the outside and an acknowledgement of when it is. So I said there are 50 research studies on gratitude, right? So there's a lot that backs what we're going here, which is why we're not going to dig into all the things. But today I want to be intentional about talking about three specific things with regard to gratitude.
So the first one is that gratitude creates a positive feedback loop for you. There is a thing called, or how many of you have ever heard of hedonic adaptation? Everyone's on mute, so I don't expect you to answer that. But if you have not heard of hedonic adaptation, let me tell you a little bit about that. We are highly adaptable as human beings. We adapt to good situations and we adapt to bad situations. And so that when you see like somebody who is like, oh my God, I could never, you know, I could never um, sleep in a, you know, on a twin size bed, right? Like they have adapted to a good situation. Then you have people who are like, I can sleep on the floor and it doesn't bother me because they have adapted to um, cultural issues with not, I mean, not cu cultural differences, notwithstanding, they have adapted to, you know, maybe a poor situation. They have adapted to maybe not having a bed to sleep in. And so therefore they have allowed themselves, they have adapted to the process of sleeping on the floor where someone may have adapted to sleeping in, you know, a California king size bed with plush sheets and comforters, right? And how those adaptations happen, it's not, adaptation is not necessarily good or bad. It is a thing that happens. It is a thing that allows you to to process where you are, whether good or bad, or somewhere in between, somewhere in that spectrum where you are at. Hedonic adaptation is basically being so used to something that it loses its power. So again, this can happen good or bad. When you are forced to go from, you know, California king size bed with all the plus sheets to sleeping on the floor, that is a negative adaptation, right? You are, you are changing something that felt good to now something that doesn't feel good. And you can actually get used to that thing that no longer, that doesn't feel good. You can get so used to it that you have adapted to it and it doesn't have that same effect. It was the same thing the other way around. You could have been sleeping on the floor and now you have the opportunity to sleep in this great, you know, big king size bed and it feels so good. And you can have adapted to that, that if you should try to go back and then sleep on the floor, right? Like something doesn't feel right anymore because that adaptation has already occurred. That adaptation has already taken place. But what can happen is, is that in hedonic adaptation, it loses its power, good or bad over you. So gratitude can fight that because it's easy to see what happens with something losing its power in a negative space. What happens when something loses its power in a positive space? What happens if you have a spouse and your spouse is good to you and, and you allow that goodness to lose its power where you don't feel so grateful for it anymore? You expect that goodness to be there. So then when you expect that goodness to be there, and it loses its power, how can that affect your relationship where maybe you're taking your spouse's goodness for granted? How many of us have ever been in a situation where we take for granted the goodness that has been bestowed on us, or we have had someone take for granted the goodness we bestow on them. That often happens in a parent-child relationship. Like kids don't really know how good they got it, right? I have had to have this conversation in particular with my teenager. My teenager went into, uh, my teenager is, is dealing with um, mental health issues. But in particular, one of the things that she has grappled onto is this concept that like she is mistreated. And one of the things that we found out during the pandemic um, is how many people are actually in abusive situations that their work or their school allow them a break from on a day-to-day -day basis, right? So my daughter believes that when she gets in trouble for not washing the dishes, like she believes this to be a mistreatment, right? And what I tried to explain to her is, is that she has gotten so used to being well-treated that she actually doesn't understand that there are some people who come home and just get welled on because somebody else had a bad day. It has nothing to do with them. But you can be so comfortable inside of a space of being treated well, that it actually, you actually lose the place in which you can see how good that is for you. So we have to be careful of falling into a place in a positive space of hedonic adaptation. And gratitude is one of those things that fight that because it keeps us present in the space of goodness, the awareness that goodness exists. So the second one is an increase of optimism. So last week we talked about how we can begin to shut our own selves down, right? We can shut down our own ability to problem solve 
when we have certain types of mindsets that don't open up and allow us to continue to think about solutions, right? So saying things like, I know, I already know that, right? If you already know it, your brain is not even thinking about how to utilize that thing in a way that can help you. When you are in a space of gratitude, the natural place of finding goodness keeps you in a space of optimism. Optimism allows you to be on the continuous hunt for solutions in particular to problems because you are not in the space of thinking that there's no solution to this problem. Optimism allows you to say, let's, let's think about this. There has to be some solution somewhere. So it allows you to, to openly problem solve and those two things don't easily correlate. Like how does the daily practice of gratitude and being grateful of overall goodness then correlate to when you get on your job, when you open up your business for the day, when you are dealing with a family situation, when you are dealing with a personal situation, and you need to stay in a mindset that allows you to continue to problem solve when it feels like you might be facing a wall. And you need to figure out how you're going to bring that wall down, get around that wall, get over that wall. Optimism helps you do that. And gratitude has a direct correlation with an increase of optimism in your, in your head, in your mental space. The last one is an interesting one because um, gratitude also reduces materialism. Now, materialism in and of itself is not necessarily a bad thing. However, materialism creates this space for the constant want and need of something. And so it puts you into a space of being in consistent lack of. If you want things, it's fine. But when those things then begin, begin to be tied to your competence, your value, your security, when you tie the, the concept of wanting and needing things to the, the worth and the value that you see in yourself, the worth of the value that you see in others, that's when you start to allow materialism to kind of take that more of a negative connotation in how you relate. That's when you start to see things at the want and the need of things from a place of a deficit, not necessarily the want and the need of things for the place of enjoyment of. And those are two different, two different things. So in the absence of not having said things, whatever those things are, right? Are you able to still find value in those relationships? Are you still able to find value in yourself? Are you still able to find value in the production of your work um, or the production of your passion? So materialism in and of itself, not necessarily bad. However, it can take on this negative connotation if it's not checked. And kind of the balance to checking materialism is the space of gratitude. And so what does it look like to practice gratitude on a day-to-day -day basis, right? And what does it look like to, to, uh, to put this in place intentionally in order for you or knowing that it will come back and help you from a health perspective, from a mental perspective, from a relationship perspective, and from a productivity perspective? So for me, the first place that I recognized this in uh, my lack of gratitude was I had fallen into a place of um, that hedonic adaptation. I have some of the most amazing parents ever. I really love them to life. Um, and every time that I have found myself in a tight situation, my parents are there to the rescue. So much so that I had begun to rely on them every time I got myself into a situation that wasn't ideal. Then I would be able to call and say, hey, mom, hey, dad, here's this thing that I need. Well, I begin to take that for granted. And one day my dad was like, I don't feel like you're very grateful for how hard that I have worked to be in a position to help you every time you've needed help. And I was like, ooh, that kind of cut. So I had to spend some time being very self-reflective about how I was relating to my parents in this space where I began to expect that every time something didn't go well for me, I could just reach over and call them and then they were going to come and fix it, even as an adult. And so that got me into thinking about how ungrateful I have been and the practice of gratitude. But initially, I only practiced gratitude every now and again when I noticed that I was being ungrateful. The space in that I live in today and that I have lived in now for the last several years is a place of continuous gratitude daily.
So my personal practice, I literally take a journal and I write three things that I'm grateful for every day. And sometimes that is a page long. And at other times, that is a sentence. Some days it is hard to remind myself of the good things that are happening around me, the just general goodness of life. Other times I am so overwhelmed by the goodness of life that it just pours and pours and pours out. But because I have been in that space of continuous practice, even when life is lifing, I am able to continue to think about solutions. I'm able to continue to, uh, to keep a high level of productivity. My relationships stay intact and my health overall is better because I'm able to continue to do the things that I know add to that healthy mindset for myself. So that's taking a break, taking a nap, going for a walk, heading to the gym, having a smoothie, eating something that feels good to my body, not just eating something that in that moment, um, you know, maybe like a little, uh, a little crutch. So overall and over time, that that uh, concept and that that practice of gratitude has really allowed for me to not even be enthralled by this concept of a month of being thankful so that on Friday we can all go and try and claw each other's eyes out while we shop for things. Right. Like it doesn't even it's like it flows right on out because I live a life of being grateful for life, for all the things that life entails. Right. So, um, so a couple of quick things um, that I want to tell you before I open up for Q&A and I tell you about your homework. So if you are new to my call, I give homework every week. <laughs> Something for you to do with this information that I am putting out here for you, right? So a couple of quick things. If you are in Denver, if you want to join me in Denver on December, it was December 10th. I had to move the date to December 11th. So now on December 11th, I'm having my first Mimosas and Manifestation brunch. I'm super excited because this is like my official launch party, we'll say, of um, my Josh Johnson Consulting. So um, if you are in Denver, come and join me at my Manifestations and my Mimosas and Manifestation brunch. Um, and I'll be putting out that link here shortly. Um, it's actually already out but I'm going to put it out again, of course, um, and invite you all to come in. Also, I do have my Excuse Me While I Live Intentionally program starting on December 10th. So the brunch and the, and the launch are kind of all there um, together. But if you are interested in learning more about that program, you can go ahead and um, schedule a quick call with me so we can talk about the program, talk about your needs and see if this is a good alignment. I can assure you this program is not for everyone. So the goal is not to get everyone in my program. The goal is that for those of you that um, are looking to um, make some very strong changes, pivot from burnout, really reduce your stress, really begin to think about how you live the life that you want to live, start working on that today and not thinking about that as this far off thing. Um, you know, if you are in that space where things just aren't quite clear, they're not horrible for you, right? Like, but but they're not where they where you want them to be, this may be a program for you. And I invite you to um, jump on a quick call for me to find out. So with that being said, I'm getting ready to open it up for Q&A. I want to give you your homework. Your homework is to start a gratitude journal. My gratitude journal is not a journal for everything. I have my own separate journal for how I assess myself and my life and just the things that I want to talk about. But when you open up the pages of my gratitude journal, it is literally a plethora of things that I am grateful for. That, that can be everything from being able to wake up in a warm bed when it's cold outside. That could be from having air conditioning when it's hot outside, right? But like literally um, having that space where every day you are challenging yourself, my gratitude journal, my gratitude journal basically takes me approximately three to five minutes to write unless I am really, really overwhelmed by some things that are, you know, taking place and in my space. But like three to five minutes, I sit down and I write three things every single day that I am grateful for. And so I want to encourage you to get a journal, something small, a little notebook like this, and be intentional, date it and write three things every day that you are grateful for and challenge yourself to stay in that place of gratitude on a day-to-day -day basis and then see how it plays out out in the other spaces and areas of your life. So before 2023 hits off, get you a journal, get you a pen, dedicate these things to um, building a life of gratitude. That is your homework. So um, that's what I have for you today. And I'm going to open it up for comments, questions, thoughts, reflections. How are y'all feeling today?
Go ahead, Jay. You can come off mute. Are you able to come? Hi, Jay. Hi, everybody. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for the space. It was right on time and much well needed. I learned a lot. Um, thank you for the distinction between thankfulness um, and gratitude. I, I never saw it that way, so I learned something for sure. And I'll definitely start my gratitude journal. Um, I would turn my camera on, but I'm outside. But I just wanted to say thank you. And it was nice um, connecting with you all in spirit. And uh, I will definitely be back next week. Awesome. Thank you, Greg said. Thank you for the homework, much needed. Of course, of course. So I will say <clears throat> that uh, I will definitely get back. I did have a gratitude journal. I didn't think of it being, my thing was always coming up with 10 things, <laughs> uh, like 10, just 10 items. Now I wasn't thinking of it because you were like, oh, when it flows, when I have, a, you know, when I'm really feeling extra, you know, grateful or whatever. And then sometimes it's just a sentence. And so um, I didn't think of it being like a journal journal, more so of a list of things that I was grateful for. So that was definitely a different uh, perspective. And then um, what I will say, and so when you're talking about hedonistic adaptation, I guess, and like being used to, so used to something, it loses its power and whatnot. One of the things is for me, realizing things don't have to be painful. You know, so like, for instance, like I was always like, I'm not taking any pain medicine because I don't want to do anything, whatever, like, you know, during that time or whatever. And then once I did, I was like, you know what? I don't got to go through this pain. So like, why do it? You know, and the same thing, like when I had my kids, it was kind of like the same thing. It's like, I don't have to, so why go through it? And so um, there are some things, you know, that I'll do um, that I can do. It's not that I can't, but then I can also deal with it in a different way. Maybe I'll delegate it or whatever. And it kind of takes that off. But I, I think, you know, it's being so used to being um, maybe in struggle, used to sleeping on the floor with no mattress, and being okay with it because you are okay with it, but it could be better, but you're just being an acceptant of something that's that's not, you know? So I don't know, it was just like a thing that I got. Yeah, I mean, for sure. Like, I think that space for, in terms of like being in a hedonic adaptation space, right? Like we have to be careful on all ends because we can be, we can get comfortable being in a negative environment, right? And so I think when we talk about that, it's easy to see like why someone would want to make a change from a negative environment to a positive environment. And when they don't, we're like, oh, well, you're lazy or you're not motivated or you're, you know, like there's all these ways in which we classify someone who isn't necessarily willing to take themselves out of a negative situation. But really it's just an adaptation because they can get used to being in that negative situation. Well, it's the same way on the other side of being able to be used to being in a good situation so much so that you don't even like you, you're not, you're not um, thankful for or in, in gratitude of that situation. And I remember like most specifically the place that that, that, that adaptation process has come to mind for me has always been in the military, because I think I will never, ever, ever forget being in Iraq. And all of a sudden being so used to hearing bombs go off that I literally don't run. Like, I'm like, boom, oh, damn. Well, who's hungry, guys? You know, and it's like, if you've never been in that situation, it doesn't make sense, right? But think about people that are living in like third world countries and people that are in these spaces that literally live in war zones. And every day they're out and about, right? Like when they talk about, you know, wedding parties being bombed. And my, like the first thought I have is if you live in a war zone, why the fuck is you having a wedding party, y'all? Like, but because you live there, this is what you are used to. So your life doesn't stop happening because the things that are happening around you are in shambles, right? And so then you think, you know, one of the most hurtful things that I've ever seen, it was the first time I visited Detroit. And I'm sitting here like they're everyday people and you got this one house on the block and literally the entire rest of the block is decimated. Houses that are dilapidated and falling down, houses that have been set on fire, right? Like all these spaces that you'd be like, how do these people live this way? 
it's not until I started visiting Detroit regularly. I mean, now I am like that. I walk into, I walk down the streets of Detroit with no problem, despite the fact that I'm about to walk past half a block that is completely um, dilapidated, right? Like how easy it is for us to get into that space. So it's easy to see when things are negative to be in that space. The hard part is for us not to fall into that space when things are good. That is really, really tough is to see things that are good for you every day. And in the, right? So that's, 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 that's one of those things that, that um, it combats. Okay, let me come back here. So the authentic taskmaster, one thing I know to be true about Jice is if she's proposing it to do for others, she is committed and exercises the same for herself. Thank you, Toy. That is 100% true. I am definitely telling you to do a gratitude journal because I know the benefits that it's had in my life, right? And that comes back to, again, like, why did I start this call? Because there are things that have happened for me in my life that I know that even when I'm not facing the most optimal situation, those are things that have happened. There are things that I've done that have allowed me to walk through those places with a lot of grace. Thank you, ma'am. Ariel had to jump off, but awesome. She said it hit home. Yeah. So, um, awesome. Well, before we hop off, you know, I'm not here about keeping, we here for a good time, not for a long time. So he, is there any other, um, thoughts or comments, any questions before we hop off? A little bit. So you were talking a bit about, um, being optimistic being grateful, whatever. So when is like optimism, like, uh, like you're just too optimistic. I, I don't know if that's like a thing, but it's like <laughs> the house is burning down. It's everything's on fire, but you're like, but I'm safe. So we're, everything is good, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so, you know, there's a switch yeah. to where it should be like, nah, you might want to go do something. You feel me? Yeah, I think I think we shouldn't confuse like optimism with like false positivity, right? Like <laughs> optimism is um, I don't have the Webster dictionary ver de definition of optimism. Y'all know I like a little bit of etymology, so I don't want to just throw out something that's not like accurate to the word. But what but the concept that at least that I take away from optimism and the way that I feel like it plays a role is even when something has happened, so the house is burned down, right? Some people will look at that and really struggle to recover. Like they're not going to recover from the loss of a business. They're not going to recover from the loss of a loved one. They're not going to recover from, um, you know, a relationship that's gone awry. They're not going to recover from the divorce. They're not going to recover from, I mean, there's things that people don't recover from. You see people who have made millions, lost millions and made millions again. And you see people who have made millions, lost millions and have gone into a depression or have committed suicide. Like what makes the difference between someone who can, be in a less optimal situation, but create a space of optimism so that they can then process what has happened or process maybe what is happening and then begin to allow the expansion of their mindset to say what then comes next. So I don't think that it's necessarily just being positive. It's saying, okay, something has happened and now what do I do? For the person who has lost millions and committed suicide, right? Like we saw this in the, what was it? The 2008 crash, right? The 2008 economic crash literally had people take their life. But also in the 2008 crash, it created a whole nother generation of multimillionaires. What happened in that space for people to lose and decide that they no longer can live? I believe that they couldn't be in a space of, of gratitude. I mean, it's almost all those things. Like now you have a place of materialism. You've attached the, the amount of money that you made to your own worth. You're not in a space where you're grateful and are able to see the goodness. You can't see the opportunities that sit before you because you're so focused in on the decimation of what you've lost or the decimation of what isn't going the way that you want it or need it to go. So I think that like, okay, your, your example of the house is burning down, like get out the house first, right? Get out the house. Now we're safe. Well, what does that mean? Where can I go and re, um, where can I go and like, create new memories? Where can I go? How do I, how do I maybe honor the memories that I have there? Where can I go and create a new life? How, where do I start the process of rebuilding and maybe changing up some things that weren't working for me the first time around? Where do I look for bigger and better maybe the next time, right? So I think that that's more of that space of where gratitude, like the first thing is I'm grateful that we didn't go down in the house. And then we, you know what I'm saying? Like we can move on from there. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah yep awesome thank you 
All right. Any other thoughts? Awesome. Well, I thank y'all again for joining me um, this Wednesday. And if all hearts and minds are clear, I will release y'all back to y'all afternoon. Thank you again. Um, I'm behind on my replays, but this replay will be out. So if you didn't catch all of it and you'd like to catch the rest, um, you can go to JiceJohnson.com and catch the replay. Until next Wednesday, I wish everyone a restful, peaceful Thanksgiving. <laughs>